Welcome back to Lost in Roshar, the ultimate journey through the Stormlight Archive. I'm Christian. And I'm Jimmy. Today, we are diving into chapters 20, 21, and 22 of The Way of Kings. And as always, full spoilers ahead for the entire Stormlight Archive series, at least of what's been published in some of the novellas. So if you have not caught up, we'll see you later. But for everyone else, welcome back to Roshar and welcome back to the podcast. We're happy to have you. Christian, how are you doing, my friend? I'm good. And you mentioned novellas just now. I'm going to be talking about novellas today because um, do you know who the the next one is going to be after this book? No, I don't. Oh, you're already surprised. We're only a minute. We're not even a minute in. (laughs) Straight into it, mate. Rock, our boy. Rock, Like Dwayne Johnson? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dwayne Johnson. (laughs) I can't even speak. Dwayne (laughs) Johnson, the rock, is coming to Rosha um, in his full khaki jungle outfit. And he's just like... And he's going to bring his tequila, his Under Armour, his shoes. I mean, that guy has more brands than I have fingers. I I, I don't even really. I don't Is know he really he's... with all the brand deals and stuff? Oh, yeah. That dude makes money. He's also the owner of the XFL, which is a football league that is uh, kind of like a feeder system now to the NFL. So oh, very, right. very interesting. All I just see is like how he's in the jungle in all his movies. So I was just trying to roll with that. I think but he cool. just likes being outside, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but. Yeah, Rock's, the Rock's going to be the next novella. And uh, I, I kind of went down that rabbit hole today when we read these chapters. So I'm keen to talk about that. How, how are you, man? I'm doing good. I got staph infection. So, uh, you know, that's not uh, cash money, as the kids say. Um, on antibiotics right now, hoping that those start to kick in here. I'm on like day three and uh, it's it's not going away. And that's not <laughs> that's not the best. So I'm, a, <laughs> I'm fatigued and my stomach hurts from the antibiotics. So um uh, the good news is recording this in the morning. I feel the best in the mornings. And then as the day goes on, I, I tend to uh, start to lose hope and want to curl into a ball on my couch and not move. But uh, <laughs> if there's anything that's going to get me out of that funk, it's a little bit of the way of Kings, my friend. Dude, the li- listeners, he's still rocking up. This guy cannot be stopped. If, Can't be stopped. If, this is why I knew from day one, Jimmy, there could be nobody else. Staff infection or no. I mean, if I say I'm going to do something, I, I 99% of the time will do it. I, I've I've done a lot this week. I think uh, I've posted <laughs> like two videos. I filmed a couple other ones. I did this podcast. I did Bend the Knee as well. And I'm like, this is the last one for the week, though. So once we're done here, I'm going to sit on the couch, play some Baldur's Gate 3, think about everything that you educate me on about rock in the, in the novella, uh, yeah. and also uh, maybe some lore deep dives as well. Um it's a good day. We're recording on Saturday, by the way. We really we release podcasts Sunday or Monday usually. So uh, we usually record middle of the week, but this time we were able to do it on the weekend, which is honestly kind of nice, right? Yeah, it's the only time where it works out for us. So it's like, you know, what is it like almost 10 a.m. for you? Yes. And nearing midnight for me. Ooh, I'm staying up past midnight. I should like light a candle. Let's let's get <laughs> let's craft some theories man let's get mysterious that midnight essence oh, oh the let's midnight go. essence i'm ready mate the kremlin um, is cracking oh I'm, I'm just like you know kremlin's get comfortable around midnight so i'm feeling good <laughs> um speaking of kremlings i'm not wasting any time let's go straight into the poll yeah let's check it out the week you can bring one type of rocherian creature onto earth which do you choose to achieve world domination Chasm fiends, Charles, Axhounds, or Kremlings. What did you vote, Jimmy? Uh, I voted on all three accounts that I could for Kremlings. And let me just say, <laughs> I'm a bit disappointed by the turnout for the Kremlings. Uh, Dude. This is clearly a meta poll. And uh, some of the commenters got it. Some of them were like, guys, you know, are any of you even listening to the podcast? It's clearly Kremlings. And that commenter <sighs> is correct. Um, I was disappointed they didn't win. Very sad. Look, firstly, those commenters, I see you and you get me through the week. <laughs> I soon people will catch on that Kremlings will just be added to every poll, regardless of relevance, until they win. Um, that's right. And that's just how we run things here. Um, but even with that, like, come on. If I thought it was going to be an absolute slam dunk that the Kremlings would win, they're just so versatile. It's like we can make a hive mind, we can create people out of them, we can like get into the, all the nooks and crannies, we can spread disease. Like this is like perfect <laughs> for world domination. So you just described so toddlers. Weird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, 
Honestly, the toddlers of the of the Rosha. It just felt perfect to me. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to read this poll. Maybe people will be upset, but at least me and the Kremlings will win. No, people nope. just see the big, they, they, they just see, look, the Chasm Fiends look good. You know, if they, you want to see world domination, you see Chasm Fiend. At initially, you think that would work. But I don't know, man. Not 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 as versatile. Just they just a bunch of tanks and bombers. They're done. Yeah, you know. You know I think we're gonna start skewing the polls and like you know just leave the other fields empty just so Kremlings can win one. You know, I'll just be like, um, okay, vote on which one is a Kremlin, um, and just <laughs> <laughs> three sticks, and then a Kremlin. I mean, and you know what? People would still troll. I thought Axe Hounds it might might be the one. I, I mean, Chasm Fiends, I guess, are kind of the idea. But, yeah. you know, they do need their sprint or they'll collapse in on themselves. So technically, yes. they wouldn't even work on Earth, Christian. Oh, yeah. Okay, Jimmy. Jimmy's <laughs> discovered the copper mind. Actually? I, I, I should not have given him this power. The power of actually. How dare you actually me? Okay, well, let's look at the stats. 50% Chasm Fiends. 50 percent um just domination i mean that is yeah. domination yeah look look poll domination is different to world domination so already <laughs> polls invalidated um charles with 13 percent. they beat the axe hounds at 11 what? and kremlings at 26 i quite liked people people like because i was when you see world domination you also think of violence right but you can dominate the world in other ways you know yeah, With Charles, you can make a whole little transportation monopoly, or something. And, That's exactly uh, right. Yeah, you could do like a like a you could be the Jeff Bezos competitor. <laughs> Get your little Chol <laughs> carriages, little packages on top. I don't know. Um, but look, I'm disappointed this week, listeners. I do love you, but I I, I expect it a little bit better next yes. week. Yes. I uh, I did enjoy uh, Tanner Sturgeon 2448's comment. Uh, shout out to you, Tanner. It says, mate, you know the Kremlin hive is going to show out. Tuck those brows, <laughs> tuck back those brows, and keep those safe hands buttoned. That's yeah, see, that's about, someone, guys. That's, see, that's someone who's listening. Right he gets there. it. And his safe hand is buttoned up. That's <laughs> it. Somebody responded, Tudor 4218 says, this is the most Rocherian comment I've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Oh, man. Oh, that made man. Me laugh. It's like uh, from Jimmy Stormbest and Christian Kremling. It's it's weird actually seeing people refer to me as Christian Kremling. <laughs> like it's a normal thing in the comments now. It. Like this is just my name. This is just who I am. Jimmy Stormbest and Christian Kremling. <laughs> <laughs> when is that the intro changing? Ooh. I feel like oh, dude, we didn't do the poll jingle. People were jingle positive. And we oh, didn't they do were. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, here, okay. If you see in a chole and it goes in a hole, it's lost in Roshar's weekly poll. Is that good? <laughs> oh, he's, oh. I just made it up right now. I don't oh, know. Golf claps and golf claps for Jimmy there. We need an applause soundboard. Yeah, yeah, we do. We need a bunch of soundboard. Things. I actually can do that. Like oh really? Can, yeah, we can do that. Oh, would well, that get annoying? Uh, yeah, but it'd be funny for us. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, nobody's listening, right? This is just us. It's just us here. Um, but I'm, <laughs> I'm excited because you sent me. You were on it this week, and you saw quite an interesting Sanderson update, which I'm very curious to examine and talk about. Yes, and that means it's time for the weekly update. <laughs> if you're Calvin or Shalon, you're tempting fate. It's Lost in Roshar's weekly update. Is that good? I'm, I'm imagining like the the Fallout guy. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, on the cover as you sing this, like the old timey fifties. Yeah, it's oh, just dude, Tef, great at this. Just Tef doing Roshar heroin, just <laughs> nodding off. <laughs> the thumbs up. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> you got—you always got to slam dunk Teft. You've got to think for it. Oh, I'm glad he's gone. All right, so oh. uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh god, he lasted no. what? How long did he last? Thirteen episodes. <laughs> the man, the man had some demons. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he did. <laughs> Uh, which we kind of get to see, by the way, in the chapters. But yes. it is time for the weekly update. And, guy, uh, you know, folks, we we, we have a, a sad one today. Uh, this is mm. not good news. Uh, Brandon Sanderson, who posts under Mistborn on Reddit, 
uh, there was a thread talking about adaptations, like where are we at, especially with Mistborn. And I will read the post verbatim so we don't leave anything out. <clears throat> and I will try not to stumble over my words here. But uh, Brandon Sanderson posted, as I indicated two months ago in the comment linked in this thread, which I now see autocorrected is making to amateur for some reason. Don't hold your breath. And this is him speaking about the adaptation. He said, I think we're completely stalled out at this point, folks, not just because of the strikes. There's a relatively small issue in regards to what we were trying to do. We got really close in some ways, uh, ways I'll be able to talk about eventually, but I don't see any kind of film TV announcement coming this year. Hollywood is scared. Hollywood is scared of Brando Sando. Even Mission Impossible is underperforming and Rings of Power did far beneath what they wanted. I think at this point I might have to try some smaller forays, i.e. not Stormlight, not Bisborn, not, maybe not even Cosmere into Hollywood to build a reputation before I can get the kind of adaptation I want. We'll see. There are still are a few possibilities in the works that could turn this around if it does happen it won't be for an announcement this year um there's a lot to unpack in this but what is your first reaction to this christian the viewers can't see, the listeners can't see but a single tear is rolling down my mm. face as, yeah. as you read this um look i got so hyped because about a year ago he's like don't be surprised if we're on set this time next year and I've like had my little calendar. I've been crossing off the dates, oh. 365, 364. <laughs> and uh, yeah, look, it's in a way it's not surprising because mm -hmm. it's almost too good to be true. And it feels so early still. So many books and series are still ongoing. Yeah. So I like I hadn't fully believed that that was going to happen, the whole onset in a year thing. Um, the thing that scares me most as a diehard Cosme and diehard mostly Stormlight fan is the prospect of him getting something non Cosme adapted and that doesn't do well. And then that, um, that's it ruins the chance of a Cosme adaptation. It's just really important what you start with. I always imagined like either Mistborn or Warbreaker being the entry point. I wonder what he means by Hollywood is scared. Maybe just scared to take risks. Cause all of these, yes, franchises are, are flopping even the big ones like mission impossible yeah um, but you know I, I, he is right like hollywood is either they're tightening things up they're tightening up budgets you're seeing it everywhere mm -hmm. but in in the wake of that you know barbie did absurd absurd numbers oppenheimer did absurd numbers dune to push back it's going to do well I, it's not going to do that kind of numbers but like there is still room for hits and also you know Oppenheimer is not some reoccurring IP that Hollywood's had. Barbie, yes, is an IP, but it's not in the movie world. So to me, it's like if I'm Hollywood, I'm looking at things uh, that are new. I'm looking at things that are maybe big properties outside of just the movie space. Now, with that said, and Christopher I know this Nolan, right? Yeah, that's Chris Paul of Oppenheimer. Yeah, that's the pull of Oppenheimer. He's Bar the, Barbie's he's the a, franchise. Yeah, Barbie and is Barbie's decades. Like, yeah, decades it's just of, like part of where, like part of just culture generally. Everyone knows and Stormlight Barbie. is not that. Uh, no, not that. but in our world, it is in our little <laughs> corner. We're like, yes, yeah, Sanderson. Sometimes we uh, have to think about out, you know, outside of the echo chamber of us and what seems, you know, because most, you know, fantasy readers are like, I'm tired of hearing about Sanderson. He's so popular. It's like he's not popular. <laughs> just so, just so we're aware, like on a world yeah, scale, in the grand scheme of things. Yes, there are way. Like, even speaking to people who aren't really in fantasy in my world, they would not have any sense of who Sanderson is. They may have heard of Mistborn, maybe, mm -hmm. but they'd be talking about something like Fourth Wing <laughs> rather than, like, the next Stormlight book. I'll tell you, you know? what, I think we're more likely to get a Fourth Wing adaptation before a Stormlight adaptation. How about that? 10,000%. Yeah, because they're just like, it's, it's viral. Yeah, All and it could be broken about it. It could be schlock. It doesn't matter. It could be bad. Whereas like and, and that, that's the key thing here, folks. I think that we we should if we're going to take anything away from this that maybe should be positive in some silver lining is that um, he needs to build a reputation in Hollywood before he can get the kind of adaptation he wants. So this is saying that he isn't just 
saying he's not getting told no just based on the idea or the material or whatever it's the fact that he has a vision for the adaptation mm -hmm. and that vision it, from what i can tell supersedes probably the resources that studios are willing to be putting into a new project like this which is kind of the climate that we're in currently at least with hollywood but things can change a, on day-to-day -day basis in hollywood for instance the Duncan egg tv show that hbo uh, was greenlighted for George R. R. Martin and the Game of Thrones universe, which, by the way, I'm very, very excited about. Uh, that is now on the shelf because of the writer strike and because of some things happening mm -hmm. at Warner Bros. That doesn't mean it's not going to be made, but it is frozen is, is the term that they're using. And they had a bunch of animated series and stuff and all that stuff was being worked on. Not not like on set, obviously, but like writing process, pilot things. And all those got frozen. So as someone who has been tracking uh, Game of Thrones uh, TV sphere stuff for a while. It is crazy how up and down it feels uh, of things getting canceled, frozen, signed, picked back up. Definitely going to happen. Green light. We're getting writers to to not hear anything about it for two years. Uh, House of the Dragon, which was very successful, that did not act. That was talked about. I think in 2016, 2017. Damn, really, these things take a lot of time, man. Uh, so. The silver lining is that Sanderson is not just trying to get something done. He wants to do it the way he wants to do it, which is so encouraging. Hey, it is encouraging. It's like, yeah, and I, that's not shocking to me. Of course, he, these are his babies, right? These, this mm -hmm. is like his. These are his masterworks, and you want to do it right, and it's got to be big, man. Yes, Miss Bourne and Stormlight need to be huge. It can't just be another little adaptation in a sea of a million or well, what seems like a million fantasy things coming out right now that are just like mm -hmm. fine, you know. Besides yeah. House of the Dragon, everything's like, eh, it's pretty fine. It's kind of yes. cool, but it's and, not and great. Yes, and in random fandoms uh, of these properties will enjoy them, but me and Christian talk about this a lot. Uh, as people who just consume general media as well, we talk about the general population, your moms and pas, uh, yeah. <laughs> the people who are going to be, you know, I have quite a few people that are not at all into the internet uh, discourse about any of these things. And those are the people I always ask about. And Christian, I know that you've encouraged uh, your family to watch some adaptations or read some books. Oh, you know what dude. I mean? Like you're able to bring them into the fold. And yeah, we always kind of gauge off of them whether something yeah. is is actually and when i when we say successful we don't mean for the fandom but successful in the sense of general success on uh, a money or appeal level so uh, i don't know <laughs> i don't know my, my biggest worry is what you said though is that your first project could doom you if it's bad and like if it's like mm. reckoners or something i just I'm just so unfamiliar, too. so I guess that's also me being scared of the unknown. The only non cosmic stuff I've read is Skyward, and Skyward is good, but it's not like where I'm reading Stormlight. I'm like, this will change everything when mm. this is released. I think Skyward you know? is very likely, actually. I, I think can so? see it. Mm -hmm. It's not bad. Like I actually quite enjoy Skyward, but I just want the Cosmere. Like the Cosmere yeah. is just a slam dunk. I don't know why they're scared. It's so perfect. Well, Rings of Power, uh, you know, the rights was a large part of that, like almost billion dollars that they spent. Like it was like mm. over half of what the money was spent was just to get the rights for like a single page in the Silmarillion, which, you know, probably wasn't the best idea. But anyways, <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things where like the budget would probably be extremely high for something like a Stormlight TV show. But a uh, Mistborn movie, I don't know. Would it cost that much? I, I, I guess I don't know. Um I worry it would about be insane. the budgets that we, that you'd need would be ridiculous. Marvel for, movie esque, probably. Yeah, and oh, Stormlight would be bigger. Just think of like to 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 pull this off in a way that doesn't look cheap mm -hmm. would be extremely hard. Especially yeah. Stormlight. Stormlight live action would be ridiculously hard between the spren and the um, landscapes of Rosha, all the moving plants, all the crazy animals. Like, it's ridiculous. So, yeah, I can see why Hollywood would be scared because it's such an undertaking. Yeah, and and I don't want to harp on this too long because, like, you know, uh, we, yeah. we, we got we got some good stuff in the chapters to get to. But I, there's yeah. two things I wanted to kind of just bring up, and mm. one is. One of the challenges I see with the Stormlight adaptation is the Shattered Plains. I think the Shattered Plains could just look very generic, possibly like outside of like a big like drone shot of the whole thing of mm -hmm. it being divided and how cool that is. But 
you know, we've talked about before in the books, even like we kind of got tired of the Shattered Plains. Like we want to go see other parts of Roshar. And I wonder if things could be moved around in adaptation to expose us more of the world, because I do think like a whole season of sitting out on the plains could be kind of mundane for a general viewer, possibly. I don't know, man. I, I don't feel that way. I kind of no? disagree with you. Yeah, because I'm just thinking of Dune, where it was just like, it's just well, sand. <laughs> it's I, well, just and you're right. Sand. I was also yeah. thinking of that. Um, yeah. It, my, my question is, is, is Sanders going to be sure. able to pull somebody as good as Villanueva? I always say hey. his name wrong, by the way. I always say it wrong. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> that was like, that, that was, was me. Um, that just was glorious. Villanueva. <laughs> just trying to get through it. <laughs> it's just like, if it's French, you just cut off about half the sounds and you've probably got it. Yeah, I'm right. in a ballpark, right? Works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's like, yes, that's the, look, the Shadow Plane has levels, man. Because you've got the chasms and they're full of life. And then you've got the storms, which are like crazy mm. visually. And I think there's a lot of simplicity, like beauty in simplicity and minimalism in the Shattered Plains. And I think it could look great. Um, you know, what? Look, as the upcoming director of photography for the adaptation, I think I have a, <laughs> I think I have some sort of authority on this. So. Christian's actually the one uh, blocking production because he just wants so much money. <laughs> That's what yeah, it is. Give me those IMAX 3D setup. <laughs> um you know what i i do agree with you that it could be done well i it's more so i worry that it won't be done well i guess is my concern like and that's everyone's worry right like yeah and that's sanderson's worry too and mm -hmm. he's probably like yeah we got to do this and look we got got this many books he's probably like talking to the cosmere and they're just like oh my god but look i actually fully trust sanderson and his the way he's handling the adaptations i feel like he I think he's on top of it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I do trust him. Um, it's just the the thing I worry about is just the overall machine. Does this work in the in the way movies are made? And it's gonna be a tough thing, man. It's gonna be yeah. Really there's tough so thing. many so many people involved. Like, how do there's you get a lot of moving through? Parts. Yeah, and I imagine he's probably very nervous because of what happened to George in A Song of Ice and Fire, <laughs> and yeah. uh, and all that, and. I know a lot of people will say, well, George didn't write the book. Sanderson did. But um, the if you if you know the books in the show, uh, the Game of Thrones TV show started diverting away from the way source before. material way yeah. before he ran. They ran out of books. And fun fact, George R. R. Martin did not even know what the finale of the show was. They didn't tell him. <laughs> See, that's just insulting. That is in that, I think yeah. he also found it insulting. Uh, yeah. he, he clearly is has to be tight lipped about things because of NDAs and stuff. But you can feel. Yeah in the way he talks about it, that it bothered him a lot. He wasn't in the writer's room from like season five on at one point. Um, why that was, we're not totally sure. I, I think I know, but I won't speculate. Um, you know, I'll leave that to another podcast. But, <laughs> but my thing is, I think Sanderson most likely looked at that and said, that's not happening to me, but Hollywood is a machine. There's a lot of hands in the, in the uh, pie or whatever, whatever the saying is. There's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Yeah. And when there's that much money put into something, there are going to be interest and people pulling strings that aren't even on set that don't even know the materials. And it's just, I can see why Sanderson would be a little bit nervous about it. But I, I think even oh, yeah. beyond all that, I think it's just Hollywood is scared is, is the takeaway from that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And look again, another experience that probably impacts him was I remember he was like, you know, giving notes and feedback to Amazon for wheel of time being, you know, being the author who's finished that series. And mm -hmm. even though he, he said things, they still disagreed and went in a different direction. And, um, maybe he's less of an authority figure cause he, he's not Robert Jordan in that case, but he's still no Rafe just, Judkins. <laughs> but it just shows that you're kind of giving thing you, you're letting go a little bit. You're letting mm -hmm. go of the reins and it's 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 scary but yeah. I, I, the, I guess the last thing to say um it's so timely now the one piece adaptation just came out on netflix and you and i were saying like it wasn't like this brilliant 10 out of 10 thing that we can't get over but it was good like it was actually good they were able and to do felt, way more with it than we thought they would yeah and like they you could feel the passion and i felt like these people running it freaking love one piece and they get it and I guess mm -hmm. that's as much as we can ask for. That's right. Stormlight. That's right. And uh, 
I would even maybe venture to say that One Piece is a harder thing to adapt than Stormlight. So <laughs> that's an easy call. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and honestly, if anything, I can pull from the One Piece live action is that a lot of the special effects I was worried about for Roshar, I'm not worried about it anymore. No, nah, man, it looks good. It like, looks it good, dude. Looks good. If that's the level, I can handle that. Yep, I agree. I can definitely handle that. Uh, the last little note is it's very interesting because Sanderson obviously has more details than us that he said rings of power did far beneath what they wanted. I know it got bad reception, but the numbers that Amazon posted for like the first two weeks were really high. And oh. that tells you that there must be a feeling or a narrative in the industry that rings of power was a flop. Like he wouldn't have mentioned that there. That's true. So, just as yeah. someone who tracks fantasy shows and, and compares and stuff, that is very telling probably of the attitude towards rings of power in Hollywood right now. So I just feel like there's such an oversaturation as well. I get like, I open up a streaming service and I just get par paralysis. Like, what do I watch? Oh, I'll just watch mm -hmm. Seinfeld again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's where I'm at. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I uh, open up Netflix and then I close it and read a book. That's oh, that's what I do. I just go, fired. I just go, man, I'd rather read the books. Uh, that, that's just how I am. You know, even read. the One Piece stuff, it's like, I don't I, read, mate. I just well, read the I, wiki. No, no, no. That's joke in poor taste. <laughs> Reading all the time. I uh, I definitely am curious to see where this goes, and and we hope it's good. If anything, more Stormlight books being written before it's adapted is a good thing to me. So, uh, yeah, speaking. like we we love the adaptation talk, but like honestly, just give me the books. Yeah, and That's and what folks, we're here for. yeah, if you get tired of the adaptation talk, you know we just think about it because the amount uh, that it can impact you know the fandom is it's it's great for good and worse by the way uh, for good and bad like it, it could go into yeah. it but it's just such an important thing uh oh. and will happen i do think it's inevitable that something in the cosmere will be adapted so it's fun mm -hmm. to speculate it is fun and hey we've got our timestamps now so if you don't care about this stuff and just want the chapter discussions look in the description or the little thing on youtube <laughs> it's very easy just skip yes. Yes, you can yeah. skip all the uh, the glorious banter about uh, <laughs> studios and me somehow always shoehorning in something about the song of ice and fire, uh, <laughs> and just general theft abuse. You know, <laughs> you, I understand it's upsetting, so let's just skip that, mate. Listen, I can never hurt Teff worse than he hurt himself. Okay. Ooh, I love that. It's, it's true too. It's kind of sad, good. actually. I guess Mo, I guess Moash hurt him more, but oh god, he's just going in for it. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's get into the chapters, Christian. Yeah. Enough yeah, of this nonsense. Um, all right, Scott. we're going into <laughs> we're going into chapter twenty one. Why men lie? Uh, I don't know if Mate, this is a, a he's skipping a, a chapter. He's wait, going, am I? He's going past it. He's oh, he's it, well, it's so pages. short. I forgot it. You're right. It's chapter twenty. Yeah. I'm sorry, and it is flashback for Kaladin, and it is the chapter named Scarlet. So we open up uh, this very very short chapter, and it's the reason why we end up doing three chapters uh, yeah. this week because this one was you know a breeze, and it's a very quick uh, flashback where Kaladin is performing an unexpected surgery on a girl from his village. He had unfortunately been nearby or had fortunately <laughs> been nearby when the girl was injured. He begins working to stop her bleeding after a short time. He succeeds in stopping the bleeding, but realizes that his success was not due to his treatment, but rather because the girl has died. He leaves her father to grieve over her, trying to cope with the fact that he was unable to save her. His father finds him and tells him that his work had all been good and her death wasn't Kaladin's fault. He leaves Kaladin telling him that he'll have a, uh, to learn how to care or when to care and when to let go. Uh, yeah. This is probably the most depressing chapter since staring into the chasm with Kaladin. Yeah. Uh, pretty heavy stuff, especially uh, at the end. That um, says, and this is a good thing, Cal thought, another tear trickling down his cheek. You have to learn when to care, when to let go. In the distance, Harl continued to wail. Yeah. Like, oh my Oof. god, that's brutal. Just such a. It's just purely um, character building scene. Hey, mm -hmm. and just like gets to the heart of Kaladin's inner turmoil. Yeah. And dude, this he's thirteen here. What he's doing is incredible. What thirteen-year-olds doing? Like thinking about which artery he's been oh, I'm picking my nose and. Playing Dragon Ball Z action figure games. I don't know, man. I wasn't doing this. That's you had the action figures out at 13. 
Ooh. Yeah, oh, bro, I had them out at 16. Are you kidding me? <laughs> 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 no, but yeah, look, it's just, again, Liren can come across so cold. Um, mm-hmm. But you see the message and you see what he's trying to do. It's just like, should he have comforted Cal more? It's hard to say, like, or I is this approach too just, high? Yeah. It's asking too much of a 13 year old. A hundred percent. And also forcing him into this role. Uh, he is not saying, hmm, you know, like maybe Kaladin should do something else. But he thinks yeah. Kaladin's talented and he is. So uh, yeah. it's, it's a really tough thing. I, I, yeah. I don't know who necessarily if he's wrong at this point in the story, but you're you're right in the fact that you're right in the fact that like it, it, he's young, he's young, yeah. but he's wrote in, in earth. He would be young, but in Roshar, maybe this is just the way of the road, you know? Yeah, man. Look, Laren's so far into it. It's like he can have that distance. Mm-hmm. You have to know when to care and when to let go. And he is right. All these things are right and they will help him. But yeah. um, not everyone works the same. You know, sometimes yeah. it's hard. And when it's 13, I would say it's impossible to be okay <laughs> after that yeah. or like not let it like seep into your psyche, you know? Yeah, for sure. But yeah. And gives a lot of insight to their relationship as well, right? Like between father and son. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a ton of love there. It's just, um, comp- it's just like that tension of like, Kaladin, I think, is interested and knows he's good too. But mm-hmm. I think he wants to help the world in in different ways. Yeah. And like, yeah, wants to let go of this. But hey, how much is it helping in the current day as we go into why men lie? Yes. Uh, I would just like to say that the opening of Scarlet, uh, the very first oh. sentence is a, a pretty massive shift after you get past it because it says i can save her cal said pulling off his shirt and i was like what a chad and then you realize that he's <laughs> yeah i was like oh what that's not chadley also kremlin <laughs> is used derogatory and i didn't appreciate that oh. at all uh did, you kremlin you storms that. leaving don't touch me miasa and i'm like hey easy <sighs> on the on hey. the kremlin okay that, and that's why i've taken it and i'm turning it into something powerful you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but I'm a bloody Kremlin, so it doesn't matter. There's a, there's a Tyrion quote about something about this, but uh, I, I digress. I won't bring it up. But uh, <laughs> yes, wear it like armor. That's right. Yes, <laughs> Why wear it like long? carapace, dude. Dude, I like that. Yeah, that works. That there see, we, we just made it our own thing for Roshar. That yeah. works very well. <laughs> So, Christian, why do men lie? Is is this a declarative statement? Like they're going to answer the question, or is it a question? Ooh. Oh, God. Oh, wait, that was too much in one go, mate. Remember, it's midnight over here. <laughs> why um, men lie or why, why men lie? lie? Well, there's no question mark. It's just so it's telling us. This is why men lie, mate. It's bloody Sadius. Oh, no, just. Oh, wait, no, we're not quite there. Yet. I'm just getting we're not quite there. We're, we're, we're with old cow over here. <laughs> we're all over the place today. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, OK, OK. Wait, yes, this is where. This is where my rock rabbit hole appears. I'm keen to get into this one. Most yeah, interesting I, chapter for me in terms of the law this week. I think this is my favorite of the three. I mean, really the flashback. I mean, it is what it is. Yeah, uh, but that's the three, moment, this was really. my favorite. So yeah. if people are wondering kind of what happens, uh, Callan's laying in the bed, whether or not he should get up. Uh, eventually, he forces himself to get up and realizes that the bridge men had all been watching to see if he would get up and continue his training routine from the previous day. And then he does what he's been doing. He's been checking on the wounded, trying to heal them up, trying to figure out how badly uh, they're down on money so he can get antiseptic. And then he gets uh, some real bad news where he finds out that Sadius has basically said, fine, if he wants to bring back injured people who can't work, then they aren't going to be fed or paid or anything. So now mm. they're going to be asking the bridgemen who are not getting a ton of food anyways to split their rations. And he has varying success to this, but Rock agrees to share some food uh, with Haber, the man who he feels has the best chance of recovering because he feels he owes Kaladin for running the death line in his place the previous day. Rock also says that he can see Syl, though she hasn't specifically revealed herself to him. Oh, yeah, uh, baby. That's a big one. And Kaladin yeah. then goes to Gaz and gets his bridge crew assigned to stone gathering duty for the day. He convinces Rock and Tef to help him gather. Uh, Knobweed, Knobweed reads over the course of the afternoon, which is a big deal because nobody 
wants to do stone gathering duty and yeah, especially think, not Zeth. Yeah, and I think even uh Rock was like <laughs> I like that. Uh, <laughs> even Rock was like, you know they're going to be mad at you, right? Like your your yeah. crew is going to hate you for this. And he's like, I know. It's fine. Rock, I love the band. I love this little blossoming friendship, hey. Rock's just he's too good, cool, man. I I, yeah, I remember he, Rock being funny, but like I like him. I like this no, character. He's just like a good bro, man. Mhm. Um okay, let's go back to the top. First thing I first thing I highlighted, um, it's when he was when Kaladin's just like trying to get up, um, which is about the first page, which is pretty standard for Kaladin. Mm-hmm. Um, let's spend a page getting out of bed, um, but he says, "Curse you have." He thought you can boot me um, out of my bunk even now. So I looked up "have." Took me a minute. Um, Kaladin's old trainer, and supposedly he mentioned like the guy basically who trained him in MRM's army supposedly he's quite fond of him so i'm keen to see if we get more mentions of have throughout mm. um the books because like when i was reading about it like it's like cal mentions him um teaching me how to punch he taught him how to do this so didn't i didn't really have any memory of that so that's going to be good to see um and then we got this moment with dabbard where he's got this battle shock so we talked a bit about dabbard the other weeks about how um all of his problems with his cognitive function but i don't know if it's that's not due to this battle shock is it that was more just from birth and eventually he gets out of this do you remember the timeline at all i do not i just i just remember that he does eventually uh kind kind of come out of it i remember we talked about it uh, a few weeks ago as well yeah and i think i pulled up uh what what kind of happens with him um so Yes, he had the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck was the big mm-hmm. thing. Right. Um, and then he gets recruited by Dalinar uh, and Kaladin assigned uh, Dabit and Shin to help Lopin assist Rock in feeding the other bridgemen. So he has that going on. And then it's uh, during the Battle of Narok, he gets left uh, alongside like Lopin, Haber and Moash to look after the barracks and assist Kaladin in his recovery. And then it's whenever they go to Irithiru. And he's helping yeah. rock in the kitchen and all that stuff. So, right. So he does like he does he can function after this. Um, this sense of battle shock. The whole battle shock thing is so interesting to me. I remember when I was like you know back in school doing World War One, World War Two, and history, and seeing those images of battle battle shocked veterans and stuff. Yeah, and it always stuck. Uh, it always like stuck with me. And seeing him do that with the Bridgemen is really yeah. It's really like cool thematically (laughs) it sells just how traumatic it is for these people um one uh one quick note about him is that he's also uh he's the unofficial mascot of bridge four but he's unable to draw in stormlight yeah that is interesting i wonder why i i guess he hasn't sworn his oath you know maybe he has maybe he has been approached but he hasn't said the words yet or something yeah, it's something that uh, Relaine also shares. Um, mm, yeah, that was then, a big point of that was a big plot, plot point in the last book. I remember that. Yeah, and it says while the others never spoke it, Relaine saw the truth in the reactions of the other Bridgemen that it was probably best that him and David uh, remain without Oof. Stormlight. <laughs> that, that's brutal. Um, mm-hmm. I do remember, I think I read somewhere that David could still say the words in his mind if he was not able to like string the sentence together. I think hmm. Sanderson did say that. So maybe he still needs to come to terms with something. See, so like that he hasn't yet. See a radiant in the like cognitive realm only or something. Ooh. Like, I like think, not- um, I think he's just got, maybe he needs to except like have it some sort of change in perspective of how yeah like how he is um because obviously he probably feels like an outcast right with bridge four definitely yeah so it's probably some sort of epiphany that needs to go uh, occur there mm-hmm. if anything's going to happen so that's cool um there's we had this little moment with sill where Callum was just saying how all the light eyes were the same including Dalinar, how dare you? But um, <laughs> she says, I don't think men were always this way. She said absently, getting a far off look in her face. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess we're getting more, it's a bit more like, you know, little hints of how things used to be. But she says, then Caladan said, there are stories about the times of the, 
heraldic epochs when men were bound by honor. I don't know, dude. It's interesting, like, the way they talk about the past here and they say honor, they mean it conceptually, but isn't it strange? Like, there actually was a god of honor. Sometimes I'm trying to wrap my head around, like, how much do these people understand yes. of the past? Yes, and also this is supposedly a translated text that we're reading as well. So, like, is some of that lost in translation? Like, there's a lot of uh, distance from the original intent of the words. Yeah, and- like, it's not capitalized. So, I suppose he's just talking about honor as, as like, a trait or a concept, not, like, yeah. a person hmm. or, like, a god. We also look at it because, you know, we think Kaladin might end up becoming honor. So, we <laughs> yeah. always look a little bit further into these. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just... I'm just always curious about like how the story, the truth of Roshar gets like watered down into Mm -hmm. religions and general, general discourse amongst the population. I'm always curious to see how that happens. And I don't think we've fully strung that together. I agree with that. I'd like to. Yeah. Yeah. It leads into a Kaladin quote um, right around that section. It says uh, Kaladin speaking to Syl. There are stories, Kaladin said about the times of the uh, heraldic, epochs when men were bound by honor but you'll always find people telling stories about uh, supposedly better days you watch a man joins a new team of soldiers and the first thing he'll do is talk about how wonderful his old team was we remember the good times and the bad ones forgetting i'm sorry uh forgetting that most times are neither good or bad they just are I like this quote from Kaladin quite a That's bit and it's very relatable. That, you know, we do have a tendency of looking back on things and, and you know, music was better back then and games were better and, and people were better. And we were just having that before we recorded. We we're talking yeah. about basically our teenage years being like all these things we enjoyed, all these games and whatever we were doing, like, oh, those were the days. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly a confirmation bias that I think every human maybe has to fall into whenever you start to get a little bit older and mortality approaches you faster and faster, uh, at least going you know towards a natural end. And I think that it might even just be a defense mechanism to think that, well, when I'm gone, things will be worse. And I think <laughs> about this all the time because... It, it, it is a common trope like my you know my uh dad as soon as he hit like 50 everything was bad <laughs> everything yeah, was awful yeah. it was so much better back then but then whenever you look at things on a whole it does seem and and i know this is weird coming from someone who's a bit pessimistic but as a whole the the humanity does move forward and makes progress uh there are always setbacks and some of them can be quite large i would compare it to something like counting cards in blackjack so I'm sorry, I'm going down a rabbit hole here. So counting cards in blackjack, a lot of people from the outside think that it means that you go to the casino and you win and use them like an ATM every time. But that's actually not how it works. It goes by estimated value, which uh, you you earn over time. It's a percentage. So mm. really, you count cards in blackjack, you might go in and win $50,000 at a high risk table, and then you might lose 100000 the next day. But over an amount of time, by the math, you will come out on top. It might just take nine months or a year, depending Mm -hmm. on how long you're playing and how much money you're risking. And I know that's a really strange analogy, but I'm using it to compare to humans where we might have a century where things go way down and it's really (laughs) bad. And you're like, oh no. But over time, at least from what I can tell, uh, things have trended in a positive direction. That doesn't mean everything's positive. Doesn't mean there aren't negatives, but as a whole, the EV eventually goes positive. And I just think that Cal's right. I think he's a hundred percent right. Yeah. And it's, um, yeah, you're right. Because it's like, it's easier to be like, oh, things were better. Cause like if everything's just improving as you're declining, it's just a bit sad. It's tough. I don't want to miss this bride. You know, that's right. I, uh, one of the things I like asking authors when I get to interview them is like, you know, what's wrong with fantasy today? Cause I interview a lot of fantasy authors, right? Yeah. And, you know, they always have some sort of critique. Uh, I've never had anyone be overly negative, but I've also seen other people ask a question and get like crazy answers. I asked mm-hmm. Tad Williams, uh, author of memory star and thorn. I said, Hey, like, you know, is there anything that concerns you about the genre? And he's like, Oh, absolutely not. I think it's the best it's ever been. And it's the best it ever will be. And it'll continue to get better. We have more voices, more stories, more settings that people are using. And He was so positive about it. And he was just like, listen, it would be easy for me to say the music I listened to in high school was the best music of all time, but it simply isn't. He's like, it's just good for me. 
in my generation. Yeah. And I was just like, man, if we had more people that were like mature in the mature years that thought like that, I think the world might be a little bit of a happier place. God, that's yeah, that's brilliant. And he's right. I hope yeah. I feel the same too. I, I try, don't want to be like, I don't want to be an elderly man <laughs> being yes. like, have you read the way of Kings? Oh, this, this gen, <laughs> this gen W580. I can't stand generation W580. Oh, you know, if there's anything that I don't want to fall into as I get older, is falling into hating the generations beneath me. Like, no, just because I don't course. understand Look, them doesn't mean they're bad or stupid. No, every generation has their things right. And this story will always be special to me, but maybe there'll be a technically better story later. I don't Could know. Could be bigger, um, better. Yeah. Just enjoy what you enjoy and cherish it is the yeah. message. What if like Sanderson's like kids take over and then like ruin the Cosmere like <laughs> Frank Herbert's son did like for Dune? <laughs> I don't know what his son did to Dune. All I know oh. about it is like the original novels. Bro. <laughs> How far does he take it? Like he just turned into like a YA like crap series, like literally oh, like no. awful, like garbage, garbage. <laughs> So, you know, or maybe I'm uh, I'm hating on a generation. No, I don't think I am. I think no, they're, no. I might be <laughs> you're just hating on bad writing, which is fine. Yes, I was um, just saying how important it is not to hate, and then I started hating. So, well, look, hey, I love Kaladin, but I'm just gonna hate on him real quick now because do it. He's he's thinking about Sadius, and look, I hate Sadius just as much as any other person in Rosha. Okay. I'm I'm ready. I'm listening. I'm leaning into Kaladin. I'm like, yeah, man, he sucks. You know what he calls him? A Kremlin. Yeah, I saw it. I have it he, circled. He called him a Kremlin. Um, I'm starting to feel a bit targeted, feeling a bit uncomfortable. Yeah, I, I think that he really should take some sensitivity classes. <laughs> yeah, okay, honestly, you can't just call people Kremlings. Okay, we have we have our own thing going on here. We've done nothing wrong. The Kremlings did nothing wrong. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> um no 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 um let's go into rock man he's seen yeah. spren what is that about i Surely don't know i was hoping you tell that, me right? because oh, i blew I my talk mind to you about that yeah i forgot this happened okay i remembered this but like i didn't remember like why like what is this right and i'm just holding on to all of rock's little titles and sayings and i'm just like oh the next novella is gonna be about rock and i vaguely remember him leaving in rhythm of war and he kind of had this morose feeling like he was never going to return and die so all these things right so i was reminding myself today as i read the chapters like what's like who is rock what's going on so did you remember that his family also rocks up um <laughs> ignoring the pun <laughs> the glorious pun um do you remember that they show up his, his family and his I, daughter I did and remember that. that i remember that there, that there was some scene with his family and then he wants to go back and all that yeah. stuff but the details well, then, are murky yeah well then i then i recall that his daughter is like the sidekick in dawn shard which is crazy too and she can see the spren and stuff as well oh my and you want to know the the coolest fact which I think is like the most interesting thing that we've uncovered for, for quite a few episodes here. The horn eaters are like human Parshendi hybrids. Wait, am I supposed to know that? Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's an in-text revelation, but Sanderson has said that. What? The Herdazians and the horn eaters are like, listener human hybrids like they got a bit oh of my god intermingling going on which That's i thought major. was freaking crazy that is but, crazy yeah how does that work yeah, <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> <true. laughs> yeah shall we get the white shall i have my kelsia whiteboard moment <laughs> and uh, explain to you uh, <laughs> yeah look yeah beyond how the hell that works it's true so the interesting thing about the listeners is they can see Spren as well. They just see him around. But what, from what I understand, Rock is still special amongst his people because I don't think everyone in his family can do this. I think um, it's him and his um, daughter are the only ones who can, and they recognize that it's like a, a special thing. Um, so the thing about the horn eater pigs, right, 
it's near this like um oh, what's it called it's like there's like little horny to oceans they're like these thermal hot springs at the, at the at the peaks of these mountains and this is where cultivation has set up her perpendicularity which is basically a portal into shades bar mm-hmm. and that's basically like the entrance to roshar if you're coming from another cosmic planet is like there at rocks at rocks house and um, he has run into Hoyd, like, arriving there at some point. I remember that being mentioned. So he's next to where, like, you can just hop into Shadesmar, where wild hoppers can come through, and he can see Spren. And later he's like, I have to go back to my people. I've betrayed them, and I'm probably going to get killed. Like, 50,000 questions from that alone. And I started to think, is Rock some sort of very important, like, royalty or something? from his Ooh. hometown you know is he is he someone he seems to be special right yeah and like you know if world hoppers are coming through can we assume that the ghost bloods have been through there and oh yeah well yeah you could I, I, I assume you can say that yeah interesting yes and and i think there's going to be a lot of dynamics within rocks people that are going to have to be explored there'll be good people and bad people just like anywhere in the world and like who knows how the world hoppers have affected, you know, if they are seeing these world hoppers and they're stopping there at all, like who knows how they've affected their, their people. Yeah, I know. Well, yeah, we've got the whole listener human thing going on. Then we've got the world hoppers thing going on. And then here, I'm going to read you this sentence on, on the copper mind, which got me excited. Oh boy. So it's about, they're called the sighted, the people who can see this brand like this. Um, okay. Um, where is it? I had it. Okay, here we go. They consider Spren to be gods. True Spren are considered to be more important than lesser Spren. And other beings such as Hoid and the Sleepless are even higher on their hierarchy of gods. The Sleepless are the the Kremlin hive mind, mate. So they're like aware of them and they're like, hey, they're at the top of the food chain here. (sighs) Oh. And then Rock's name is Rock, right? Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's uh, the cherry on top. Oh, <laughs> uh, he's trying to tell us something. He's trying to tell us something. That dang what Sanderson. Does Zeth ever meet Rock? And he's like, oh. <laughs> I <actually like> <laughs> <at> him. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> he like steps on his foot by accident. Oh, God. Stonewalker. <laughs> um, but I don't know, man. I just, I just saw all that and I started to get that feeling like, I just start to get that feeling, you know, that yeah. feeling. More I like it. I mean, there's definitely something to all of that. And I would like to hear some more theories about it. We'll have to keep an eye on it as we go. But also, you know, if anyone has any ideas, make sure to span read us lost in Roshar, gmail.com or you can leave comments on, a uh, on the YouTube over there at lost in discovery as well. Um, very, very interesting. Rock is super duper important. Yeah. I just wonder what it's like up there. Like, do they just pop into Shadesmar and like have a chat with some Spren and pop out? Like, I would like to see how these things work. Yes. Like, if I pop, if I go into the hot spring, do I literally just pop out on the other side? Like, I'm going into Narnia or something. I don't know. Who knows? But he can see Spren. He's gifted for some whatever reason, and um, he has a cute little moment. And I think Airsick Lowlander as a um, insult is a freaking slam dunk. It's really good. As someone who doesn't yeah. like storms as a uh, as a you know in world swear, I think that this is good. But by the way, storms make sense as an in world swear. I understand the levity of it in these in like this world. I just don't think like it's like it doesn't sound. Man, it's intense. such a hit or miss for me. Sometimes it works. Sometimes I'm like, ah. Storm you know? Father sounds a little better um, as like a thing, but like S- Storm just doesn't have that hard consonant that it needs at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, you know what? what I mean. Um, for all the hate I give Wheel of Time. Yes. It's got good curses. D- yeah, especially um, in the context that they're used. Like, I, I, I agree. I'm not like the biggest Wheel of Time fan, but I do think that they're effective in that series. The, like, Storm U just sounds like a substitute. Yeah, yeah. Which is like, what it really <laughs> is, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> but I do like Air Sick Low Lander, like, has just has it's a, so a rhythm to it and it sounds yeah. good. Like, I've called people Air Sick Low Landers at like, the grocery store when they're in my way and they're like what what i'm like nothing <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a, I, I could see catching on yeah that that really 
it, yeah, it just works. I don't know what it, what is what is it about a curse word that makes it work. You're, you're well, about that hard consonant. I I like the hard consonant, but it's it's hard to put the finger on it because a lot of people like like storms. Um, so you know, I, I don't can't. know. I think as an Australian, the home of swearing all the time, <laughs> I'm gonna say storms is not in my top ten. Is it is it so. super hard for you to keep the podcast so clean? It is. <laughs> It's an impossible <laughs> task. It is an impossible task as an Aussie. Um, no screw ups yet. See, even then I had to pause. I had to pause. Um, <laughs> it's oh, tough man. being Australian. It is tough. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the only uh, I'm looking at what else I highlighted here. I found it interesting that the soul casters needed like separate stones or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. to 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 make it into grain i figured is that because like you're convincing an object to change its form so talking to a really big one is more difficult as opposed to these little stones kind of how i think it works yeah one of the things that kind of has taken me back about our read through so far and only being um you know a decent way through part two i think we have like a little less than 100 pages left in part two Mm -hmm. is how like many times soul casting is mentioned like Sanderson is really hammering. Mm. Like it is constantly being done reference to uh, explain. So I, I think that soul casting um, was a lot more prominent in this book than I remembered. Yeah. And just like the unnatural smoothness of the buildings. Yeah. It's, it reminds me of whenever like that Rick and Morty episode, when Morty like stands on absolute flat, <laughs> ground and he basically collapses because it's so gloriously flat that is a great (laughs) reference yeah (laughs) that's what it feels like um there was this heavy um chat when he was talking to teft right basically getting Mm -hmm. teft on side and being able to help and um he says death isn't better kaladin said looking in uh, looking Teft in the eyes. Oh, it's easy to say that now, but when you stand on the ledge and look down into that dark, endless pit, you change your mind, just like Hobber did, just like I've done. He hesitated seeing something in the older man's eyes. I think you've seen it too. I, Teft said softly, I, I have. I was like, whoa. Yeah, pretty heavy stuff. And mm-hmm. even before that, we kind of get a little bit of a hint that Teft might have some unsavory traits as an individual. Um, Tef says, I've given my loyalty before. Too many times now. Always works out the same. Your trust gets betrayed? Kaladin asked softly. Tef snorted. Storms, no. I betray it. You can't depend on me, son. I belong here as a bridgeman. And, uh, you know, I think this is maybe giving a little bit of a hint to uh, Tef's past vices. 100%. Yeah, it is there. It is there. I thought of it straight away. I'm like, okay, this was thought of. Yeah, someone who... uh, declared in a, a review video that he thought the Tef the drug addiction was out of nowhere. Um, I'm already seeing that I was wrong. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I like that one, that one was good storms. No, see there it works for me. That's what I mean. It didn't work for me. Really? Ooh. No, I read it and I was just like, okay. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just a <laughs> hater Christian. I'm not, I'm not dedicated enough to the Cosmere. It is what it is. All right, look, Look, I'm going to get you dedicated right now. I'm going to show you dedication by doing this because I thought I wrote this in my notes that we should do this on the podcast. So we're going to try to pronounce Rock's name. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Who's going to yeah. do it? And I thought Jimmy, who's like known for his pronunciations, would <laughs> love to do this. <laughs> Listen, I'm dyslexic. That's not nice. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> you can't be throwing that at me. All right. Let's go. All right. What do you got? Numahuku. <laughs> Makia Kiaia Lu Namor. Oh my god. See, that's that, where we need the clapping soundboard because that was, I feel like I nailed it. I think he nailed it, dude. I think I, I think that's it. how he said it to them as well. He just like really drew, drew it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like, let me break this down into syllables. Yeah. God, it is all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and I'm gonna highlight it as I go. Maybe that'll help me. Okay. Numu Hukun. Nah, I'm not. It's Jimmy's. Jimmy's nailed it. I'll give it to him. You won this round, mate. Numu Hukun Makai Alala Manor. <laughs> oh, hey, that was good. I, I don't think that was right, though. I think I just made up the end. <laughs> like my hey. eyes just gave up halfway through that word. <laughs> your eyes, your hands, or spheres, mate. Oh, transition and a half. Wow, what a transition into <laughs> chapter 22. Uh, 
<laughs> we might as well spend the episode. That's about as good as it's going to get. <laughs> that was fantastic. I'm so impressed right now. Ice Hansel Spheres, dude. Interesting right. that he used that for the chapter title. It does sound good, but like it's an interesting thing to pull out of this chapter. To make yeah, I don't think it's something I would have pulled out. Um, maybe there's Which more. Which your, your hands on your spheres. <laughs> Any of them, honestly. Yeah. Uh, so I guess we should talk about kind of what happens here. Uh, this is from the Dalinar POV, and he essentially goes to uh, the feast, the king's feast with his sons. This is where Adolin ends up finding out that, in fact, Dalinar did ask to end the vengeance pact, which is going to have a bunch of ramifications throughout this chapter. Mm. But also we get to hear about the infamous strap that was cut on Alucard straight away battle. Yeah. I mean, come on. It, <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, <laughs> we also get the debut on page of lady Navani, Gavilar's widow yes. and Dalinar's sugar mama. So <laughs> <laughs> he tries to hide his attraction to her, but, uh, doesn't do such a great By eating job. angrily. That yeah. Was a funny it. little bit. <laughs> so weird. When uh, you look down at these plates, there's empties like, oh God. <laughs> Storm it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, King Alucard also pulls the rug out from Dalinar and finds out that Sadius is now high prince of information because he feels like Dalinar is not giving the investigation serious enough mm. attention. And Dalinar realizes that Sadius's way of outmaneuvering um the high prince of war idea. So I realized that this was Sadius' way of outmaneuvering the high prince of war's ideas. So yeah, some political maneuvering, an introduction of a character, and furthering the question of what happened to this strap on Al- Alucard's uh, saddle, which is the least interesting thing in this chapter by a mile. Um, no, mate, I demand to know. I'm at the edge of my seat. <laughs> Was it a cut? <laughs> I demand answers. Oh, Dude, my. when he got named High Prince of information i was just like i wanted inquisitor glockta to show up and just show that is what that really is it would have been nice yeah. wouldn't it yeah it's just whenever sadius like you know you're like you're kind of on the fence about sadius at a lot of points because dalinar shows him some respect even though he knows he's playing it but he's like hey at least sadius cares about the king and like he's concerned about the king yeah and so you do you play this get back and forth game with sadius earlier in the book where like you may not love him but you're like well maybe he's okay you know maybe maybe he's just a complex kind of character but then this happens mm-hmm. and you're like man i hate sadius yeah he straight up is being malicious at this yeah. point we just want adolin to stab him now yeah like can we speed that up no yeah. <laughs> allegedly 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 stabbed him um i liked right at the beginning before we get into the strap um how the storm wa- storm wardens are project project ugh predicting the seasons mm-hmm. like yeah a few weeks of springs followed by summer hopefully it wouldn't be winter i'm like wow there really is no order hey because yeah. i knew that there was a different amount of time for seasons like weeks or whatever but i didn't realize it could just be a different it just could be winter instead of summer next That's, i love that and i yeah. love fantasy series that play with seasons obviously a song of ice and fire <laughs> the broken earth by nk jemison one piece also messes with oh, season. I like One Piece's seasons. Really I love cool. the see. I love that. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but there's something about the unpredictability of seasons or extreme seasons that just like get me as a reader. What is I it love- like in Broken Earth? What do they do there? Uh, Broken Earth is just like everything's horrible. Um, so oh. then you have, yeah, <laughs> like you just have these uh, almost like extreme versions of. Um, Oh, how do I how do I say this? It's like earthquakes and geological like disruption and mm. and whatnot. And and there's a reason for it that I can't really say. So it, it it just has a lot of bad bad seasons, and the world almost feels like it's coming to an end. Mm. Um, and then it's it's almost also kind of like an extreme climate change kind of deal. So I'm a big fan of the dying earth as well. So dying earth is just like whenever you're on a world that is co- to- towards its end. And a lot of times it's like a high tech civilization has reverted back to like medieval times. I've, I've always been a big fan of that book of the new sun by Gene Wolfe is the one I'm currently reading that I'm just like, Oh, I love it so much, dude. I'll tell you about <laughs> it off the podcast. Cause some yeah. of it's kind of spoilery. I don't want to ruin it for any of the listeners, but uh, Jack Vance wrote the dying earth series as well, which is again, kind of a earth that's dying. And then yeah. people are you still say, yeah, right. <laughs> Crazy to think. Uh, but 
you know, in that world, there is still technology, but there's also magic and there's things that you can't really like account for. Uh, Cage of Souls by Adrian Chofkowski is another. I didn't like that book, but I like the idea behind the book, which is mm-hmm. also, again, the sun is burning out. There's only 100,000 people left on the world. And just like, crazy. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So I love this. Uh, when I read this in this chapter, I was like, man, I forgot about this and I love it. Yeah. Because like the, and then like a song of ice and fire is the complete opposite, where it's like years mm. at a time. Long. And then I thought of the adaptation. It's like, man, what do you do? Every episode's like, oh, now it's this season. Now it's that season. I think that's one of the things that gets cut. Yeah, <laughs> straight up. I think it just wouldn't happen. I think it would just always be kind of, kind of normal, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but hey, we get our first mention of chickens, which are not really chickens, because he <laughs> said they can fly. And this is my favorite meme of one of my favorite memes of Rosha that every bird is a chicken. I just love that because they just that's their word for bird. They just now like that's that a chicken. A wild idea, right? Yeah, <laughs> like just, it, every bird's a chicken, and it's always like a fun game. Like, what is this chicken actually? Because <laughs> I don't think it is a chicken. I love it. Yeah, that that can be a new segment. Like, what is this chicken? <laughs> <laughs> um and we get more stand-up comedy by I wit. wit now i have a question about this go ahead so we get taught so let me back it up a little bit so dalinar yeah. talks about the setup of this kind of like garden area and how it reminds him i think he says it reminds him of the pure lake yeah and how was, he was yeah. out there right and i was mm-hmm. like oh okay so dalinar has been to the pure lake whenever he was young i kind of wonder if anything happened while he was there possibly just wondering uh it's probably probably in the flashbacks eh? you know uh, spring yeah yeah maybe we should i can't remember yeah i would say so so um he ends up saying uh, the feast basin had been flooded, to, uh, turning it into a shadow artificial lake. Circular dining platforms rose like small stone islands in the water. The elaborate miniature landscape had been fabricated by the king's soul casters who had uh, diverted the water from a nearby stream. It reminds me of the Sella Tales, Dalinar thought as he crossed the first bridge. He'd visited that western region of Roshar during his use the youth and the pure lake. And Hmm. it's like in the pure lake is tacked on at the end. And I felt like that mattered a lot. Like it's a very specific reference and it's at the end. And I was like, "Mm, okay. Well, well for me, okay. I'll cross check now, but from the top of my head, cellar tales are like the islands that are the giant um, turtle thingies. Yeah. The moving islands. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, Or maybe I'm wrong. Um, no, I think that's one of the silver kingdoms on Rosha was a monarchy that claimed the pure lake, Marabethia, and a bunch of other places. Mm-hmm. So I think that's like the the overall area. I could have sworn that uh, maybe they do have those islands there, but whatever. Well, I'm gonna go a little. I'm gonna go a little crazier here. Oh, okay, hell yeah, yeah let's do this it. This is just a setup. So I'm just saying, pure lake Dalinar, interesting. Like maybe we should right, okay, that. but. It says there were five islands and the railings of the bridges connecting them were done in scroll work so fine at, that after each feast, the railings had to be stowed away uh, lest a high storm ruin them. T- tonight, flowers floated in the slow current periodically a miniature boat, only a hand spread wide sailed past bearing an infused gemstone. So there is a geometric setup of these islands that are, uh, that form something, right? Mm-hmm. And Hoyt is sitting at the top or like what would be if you looked at it from the top, it would be he would be at the top of it at the beginning of it, like at the head. And this made me wonder, Christian, oh, here we if go. you drew this on a piece of paper, the way it's described, do you think it might create like one of the symbols or or, or maybe a map of the Cosmere planets? Because like there's these islands and water between them and then Hoyd sitting at the top. Like, I feel like there's some yeah, symbols. It's very symbolic. There. Okay, it could and, be like, and a very good dis- description. I like for, that. You might be able to write, and I'm not an artist, but I think that you could, you could like actually draw a map of what this looks like on a piece of paper. And I'd be curious to see if you did, if it would formulate one of the symbols that is put in the back of the books for one of the orders, or if it could be like a Cosmere thing where it like. That would be so good if, if that's the case. It just feels like a really specific. I like that. Design. What you pointed out, like the imagery of Hoyd sitting above it all. Like It I'm- seems so intentional. Yeah, that, I, that that was totally lost to me. I'm so glad you pointed that out. Um, five 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that would be something cool to look into. It's just I, I start to think of like who made this. Like yeah. before we'd have a have a part of the setup. And interestingly, like that little like mechanical well, not mechanical, but like Fabriel powered boat that's going through it all. Interesting, interesting. Mm-hmm. Like is that gonna like I and maybe that's just the symbolism of traveling through or something, but just just the way it was described, I immediately started thinking about what it would look like from above, like on a map. And then I thought about the fact that Hoyd was sitting there at at the top of it. And I was like, hmm, is this yeah, like, like smear thing? That's that's what would sell it for me. The whole Hoyd looking everything. That seems very intentional now that you pointed out. Um, and it's like always a setting that like kind of stood out to me. Even like many books later, I always remembered this little dinner because of how unique the setting was. Yeah, it listen to the description. So Wit sat on a raised stool at the end of the bridge leading onto the island. Wit actually dressed as a light eye should. He wore a, st- a stiff black uniform, silver sword at his waist. Dalinar shook his head at the irony. Wit was insulting each person as they stepped onto the island, and then, you know, he goes into it. But it's basically, it's the final bridge to the final island. And it's the King's Island, so it's like the top. And it has a pole mounted gem lamps ringed it, uh, glowing with blue stormlight, and a fire pit dominated the center of the platform. Deep red coals simmered in its bowels, radiating warmth. Elakar sat at the table just behind the fire pit, and several high princes are with him. Tables along the side of the platform were occupied by male and female diners, never uh, both at the same. And then this is where we see Wit on a raised stool at the end of the bridge, like kind of like <laughs> almost guarding it. And I'm like, does this does this island represent like Roshar and Wit is trying to like protect it or slash, you know, be in charge of it almost? I just think each island is like a like a planet in the cosmos. Even if it doesn't, like that is like a metaphor or like a symbolism. Yeah, symbolism is just great. Yeah. So and and maybe I went too far, which I always do. Um, (laughs) That's no, that's what we're here for, man. We're here to take it all the way. I just want someone to to draw it or is there significance of the five islands? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Someone, I remember somebody commented like we're waiting for Jimmy to get that freaking slam dunk theory. What if this is it? This could be it, man. <laughs> book, book five. It starts off with like a zoom in from the clouds and there's five islands. I would die. That's a whole <laughs> I would chapter. Lose, I would lose my mind. Jimmy's done it. Oh my the god! The mad man, he's done it. Jimmy Stormblast. <laughs> or what if it like represents like Rock's home? You know what I mean? Like with oh. all the it's there or something? Like, oh yes, yeah. There yeah, they, they could be something really cool like that. I like what you're getting at. I just yeah. can't substantiate it right now. No, nah, me either. Honestly, it's probably nothing. But we hey. should probably I probably should have stopped at Hoyd protecting the island that had pretty much Roshar. <laughs> you have know, the stormlight blazing, the king. Yeah, um, cultural significance of men and women not sitting at the same tables definitely represents Roshar. Like, oh yeah. So I don't know. I like it. you get a lot of that stuff, like the different types of food as well. Mm-hmm. Like men are having their curries, women have. And Dalinar food. sneaks a little bite of the female yeah. food. <laughs> I don't know why, but that Boy. made me laugh out loud when I read it. Like imagining him just be like, mm, yeah, <laughs> like, ooh, a cupcake, <laughs> very feminine non, like yes. What? <laughs> I, I like um <laughs> I, I like uh it was also another cute moment with Dalinar when he said um to wit like I see a fine man in you because he's like wearing the right stuff. Yes, he's like, I see a fine man in you. Watch out. Like and Dalinar even kind of gives him a little bit of a uh, uh witty comeback, uh-huh. and then Wit's like, Oh Dalinar, maybe you should be the Yeah, way. that was so I love that exchange. That yeah. was a total win for me. I'm like, that's brought it back from the bad joke. Yeah, um, then, then then he does the, 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 the that was a real bad one, and I wrote second worst joke so far. Did you? What did is you, it? <laughs> you got to read it because if not, I I know what it is, I can't find it in my book right now. Okay, line it. Okay, this is this is with um Navani, right? <laughs> and he's saying she smells pretty much, and she goes, "Obviously, your own stench overpowered mine." Wit, a warm feminine voice said, "Has no, has no one done my son a service and assassinated you yet?" No, no. No assassins yet, Wit said, amused. I guess I've already got too much ass sass of my own. This doesn't even really make any sense. <laughs> I know, I know. I guess that's not, it, like. And not in like the funny like Will Ferrell way where it doesn't make sense. <laughs> it's funny because it doesn't make sense. I just think this is. I mean, I I'm doing it no favors through my 1 a.m. delivery, like stumbling <laughs> through that like a drunkard. 
No, don't be so still. hard on yourself. I think it's just a bad joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't great. Um, but seriously, Dal and I giving it back to him was was great. It was so good when when he's like, No, I'm wit, but I understand when he, when he calls him, oh, I can't do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm reaching that point. I said, No, I'm wit, but I understand how easy it is to make um as easy a mistake as that is to make because you blow so much air down our ground, or because you make so much noise. And uh wit's like, Holy cow, Dalinar. I'm yeah, because he's talking about mistaking him for the storm father. So yes, good. and maybe I should make you wit. Then I could be a high prince <laughs> instead. He stopped. No, that would be bad. I'd go mad after more than a second of listening to them and would likely slaughter the lot. Perhaps appoint Kremlings in their places. The kingdom hey. would... And I I actually oh. laughed because it said, then the kingdom would undoubtedly fare better. And remember how we were talking about how the Kremlings might be watching and then they're <laughs> trying to become like the dominant species? And it, literally, he says, perhaps appoint Kremlings in their place. The kingdom would undoubtedly fare better. And I'm like, huh? And dude, he these... knows about them. I for sure he knows. Just asking. Hey. I feel like this might be a deeper joke, dude. After all the hate we're getting for the Kremlings, this was a nice little win. Yeah, Maybe the kingdom would be better. One for right. the uh, team Kremlin. Take that twenty six percent poll. I remember you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Navani, <laughs> man, did you start feeling the butterflies in your what a babe. tummy? Yeah. What, 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 what an absolute Stacy. Of a character, I I just Stacy. Yeah, it's the female Chad. Um, oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, she just has I that kind of. Isn't it Stacy's mom's got it going on? Oh man, you know Fountains of Wayne. Uh, that that CD it was called Welcome to Highway Interstate Managers is my favorite CD of all time. And the Wait, lead seriously? singer, yeah, and the lead singer died during COVID. I was oh, so no sad. Way I, I so didn't sad. know they had other songs besides Stacy's mom. No, that album is incredible. Oh no way. Yeah, this is very oh. random, I know, but I just wanted to <laughs> that it's random. <laughs> yes, it's my favorite CD of all time. Fountains of Wayne, Welcome Highway Interstate Managers, or something like that. I can't remember exactly now. I still have it somewhere. Nice. Back, back to the show. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Navani <laughs> is a unit and can make Dalinar squeam uh with just a glance, which I think oh. is fantastic. Seriously, the best part was him looking back at his plate for comfort and it was empty and the sheer <laughs> the sheer panic that arose in him was just comedy gold he, he was not handling the situation That's, well at all dude adolin's like worried about his dad not being cool but i'm just i was just like the the dude pulled out his dinner knife from a freaking sheath pretty dope. he had it on him ready like i wouldn't be worried if that was my dad i'm not worried about war, it. man yeah, dude, Dalina is a boss, um, but he's kind of in love with his brother's widow. What do we make of that? Hey, you know, the heart wants what the heart wants, I think. And then, you know, also with the foresight of, of all the books, we know that Navani probably would have been better off with Dalinar anyways. Uh, so, And she had feelings for him too, you know, hey. playing each other off. I guess you have to marry the older brother in these sorts of worlds, you know. What's the quote from uh, Step Brothers? Like you had the... He had the uh, old bear, now, to, now he went the young cub. <laughs> <laughs> Man, Step Brothers, what a classic. I haven't seen that in forever. Um, and going going on with Adolin, man, I felt like what a little what a little brat when he's like talking to Dalina. And what if they are delusions? What if you're just getting old? Yeah. Really? Give this him a break, break man. Break. This whippersnapper. This I, the I, Blackthorn, dude. Just because he's wearing some uniforms and he's not wanting to fight everyone. Yeah. <laughs> it, it it feels like slightly ridiculous. Everyone treats Dalinar as such a joke whenever we know that he's so capable of like some very violent things. And like at this point in the story, we have no reason to question it. But like knowing Dalinar's backstory, it's like. How did people like even if he's acting, you know, delusional or crazy or whatever, like I would still be like, well, I certainly didn't want him to to be mad at me because he is. I mean, we saw that a little bit. Like they're like yeah. he's still like got enough of a presence to like everyone will hush and part part out of the way for him. Even though he doesn't have his entourage around him, no one's gonna really outright mess with him. I was just you know, and you're right. Him. And also, yeah. family talks to family different. Um, <laughs> yeah, straight up, like, like, like you know what me. I mean. Like it's it's my dad. <laughs> you know, I see him in his whitey tidies when he's putting on his shard plate. Like you know, he's not some <laughs> Walter White. 
Yeah, his Walter White tidies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you see when she rested a cloth safe hand on his shoulder? A gesture reserved only for family. Oh man, there's safe hand stuff over here the whole time. Uh, as always, the women uh, they were painting and calligraphy, and they kept their left hand shrouded in their sleeves, delicately creating art with the right. Navani has a safe hand. She's placing it on the shoulder. I mean, there's a you lot of what, man? Hands being covered here. Some legend in the comments directed me to a Sanderson writing lecture to the timestamp where he explains safe hands. Excuse and me. And it was so good. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want the exact quote on like examination of safe hands, writing lecture episode six, uh, I think it was like one hour and 11 minutes something like that i gotta watch and, it yeah yeah it's great but he pretty much said he was obsessed with like um sort of superfluous traditions um that have come out of seem- seemingly innocuous things in the past and basically the the short of it is that the safe hand came from most of the feminine arts being a one-handed deal like painting, calligraphy, whatever. Okay. Um, and then it became, okay, let's let's cover the safe hand. And then he also, what was a, an interesting point? I, I may be butchering it, guys. It's 1 a.m. here. I'm, I'm slowing down a little. But an interesting point was he said it helped men when, you know, they had male and female radiance, but when they all betrayed their oaths or whatever, as women covered their safe hands and were only able to do one-handed things, it basically freed up 50% extra. It, it cut out 50% of the competition for shard blades and everything. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I like There's that. a lot of cool points. He, I mean, Sanderson's incredible in those writing lectures. Go to that one. Listen to him talk about it. Not not some Aussie dude um, <laughs> doing the slow blink. The slow the, blink. The slow blinks are starting, you know. Well, like, hey, man know about the safe hand <laughs> i mean i'm glad that you you watched that i didn't know if that is uh that's an incredible thing and shout out to the people who always leave us good resources in the comments and stuff oh, you guys do an excellent it's the thing. best yeah and a big shout out also to sebastian who sent in the uh, span read to us and said uh, that he loves the show and watches it with uh both of his teenage boys which i think is pretty cool because lost in roshar's for the family <laughs> man I, I was telling you earlier i've never gotten so like such nice messages like we've been doing videos for for a while, but it wasn't until I, we did the podcast that I've gotten really, really nice emails, really nice messages. Um, it's been a really good feeling that um, people are enjoying this. Yeah, it's a more dedicated audience, honestly. Yeah. Um, in the multiple podcasts that I do, um, I've always found that the interactions usually have a little bit more substance. It's not to say I don't get good comments and stuff in my videos. I do. I have people I love seeing comments from. But it just seems like the uh, the consistency of quality uh, whenever we get feedback or, or whatever it might be is generally very high. So uh, we definitely appreciate uh, anyone that takes time to reach out to us, especially when it's something as nice as uh, Sebastian's email was. So th- yeah, thank Yeah, that was really nice to read. Yep. And just cool. It's just cool. Sometimes I forget people are listening. Yep. <laughs> I mean, actually, my, almost all the time I forget people are listening, to be Same honest. Here. Yes. And the thing so. is like, something about a podcast, right? Because if I watch a good YouTube video, I'm like, oh, that's a good video. I probably forget about it until maybe it pops up somewhere again. But podcast episodes, like, I remember where I was because I'm, I'm doing something else. I'm on a walk. I'm in my car. I'm on a plane, whatever. Like, And then when I'm in that area again, I might think about that episode. Or Wow. That, it, it sticks with me more, right? But wow. with videos, not so much. Yeah, you know, I I agree. So like whenever I've had some of my favorite podcasts, I think about the time in my life in which I listen to them. Yeah. Like I, I can flash back to like time period. Like I remember everything I listened to like in COVID. Uh, I remember what I used to listen to on my long commutes at my old job back in 2016, 17. Like it, it's it just fills space of experiences, you know, of what you're doing in the time that you're in. So I, there is something to that. You're right. Yeah. Like I there are some really um big youtube videos that i would love but you know i can't even tell you half of them right now i would have to like go through my liked videos and eventually find them and be like oh yeah that one's a banger 
They're but so podcasts, true. Man. Yeah, but podcasts are a bit different. I don't know why they. Yeah, same thing with songs, right? Like, yeah, yeah, it's that feeling of like you could smell something and be like, oh, I remember that. Yeah, you you know that one pop song. It's like I did a one eighty. Baby. <laughs> it will leave a baby. Yeah, uh, every time I hear that, I think of Las Vegas, and uh, <laughs> I went. We went to Las Vegas for my wife's conference, work conference. So she was in a conference, and it was like seven a.m. I'm I'm intoxicated. <laughs> and I'm gambling in this song playing. I'm like, oh yeah, this is great. You know, and she's over there doing work. Like I remember that song. And every time I hear it, I, I can like remember walking into the Cosmopolitan Hotel. Um, so there's something about audio and experiences and when it plays that just oh like, yeah. Um, like, cut, on cut to Gus Fring. Um oh. his dinner with Walter White and Walter explains that connection. Oh. Um, if you want that scientifically broken down for you. But for me, when you spoke about COVID, you know what soundtrack plays in my mind? Stardew Valley, baby. I'm That's waking good. up at summer. I'm watering my crops. I'm checking <laughs> on my chickens. Good <laughs> times chickens. for that. You know, I, all, my, all my animals in Stardew Valley were named like via series. So all my chickens were Stormlight characters. I had Kaladin and Shalana and all them. <laughs> and then all my pigs were first law characters and like, <laughs> i split it up by by animal it was the best i love it dude i love yeah. that <laughs> oh my god gotta revisit the farm <sighs> so so there's not much else to this chapter to be honest um no. We, we end up hearing that Sadius is outmaneuvered not on our, we kind of already talked how much we hate Sadius. The strap thing still under investigation, but Navani and Dalinar meeting and the internal struggle that Dalinar is having about Navani is very clear. Um, but Navani she's is up in front. Hey? Yeah. She, she's she's like, dude, my, my son sucks. Yeah. And he's like, he's is she great. testing my will? And he's yeah. like, he's the king. And she's like, yeah, but a weak one at that. Right. And he's like, ah, woman, <laughs> <laughs> woman with brains. What do I do? Oh, me hit rock with stick ah, you know very uh caveman-esque I, I don't know about you but for some reason in this chapter there's eating there's like a male not knowing how to interact with the female so i see all this in my head right now as someone who doesn't visualize a lot as an anime you know what i mean oh, yeah. like anji yeah. from one piece like eyes big or you know whenever they eat in anime is like a dragon ball z and like <laughs> that's how i imagine yeah. dalinar eating for some reason it's like so stupid. yeah he's got that big like brow sweat coming down yes yes that's exactly yeah. it <laughs> i love it and for some reason he's wearing like a japanese salary man um, <laughs> suit with his little briefcase <laughs> give me the stormlight anime i'm in i'm all yeah. in oh please <laughs> oh Oh man, good good yeah, man. chapters here. Not not the deepest dives yeah. on things, but I think a couple of little breadcrumbs that that led yeah. us down rabbit holes. And uh, you know, now we're we're getting into the back half and the final pieces of of part two, and then it's kind of off to the races at, after this. You know, we're going to see Bridge Four coming into their own, and we're going to see Dalinar uh, go further into his conflict with himself. Yeah, man. After part two, I think it, it's going to pick up quite a bit. And yeah. you know who I missed, dude? I miss Shalon. I agree. I tell you, she's my favorite part of the book, man. Those are the juiciest chapters. We were talking forever about those. I have never seen so much hate for a character, dude. It's crazy, right? Like, Lyft is hated, but, like, that kind of makes sense, in my opinion. Like, it, she's she yeah. is, like, over the top, so I get it. But, mm. man, like, every time I mention Shalon on my book <laughs> channel in a live stream, there's like one person that's like, Shalon's cool. And then it's like a hundred that are like, Shalon's a war criminal and I hate her and they should shave her head. I'm like, what? Shalon's a war criminal? I'll have I have to mean, examine that one. No, that's they've never said that. I made okay. that up. But, but they hate her. I mean, people are like, I hate Shalon. She's the worst character. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I just don't, I don't hate her. I just, no, no, not even close, man. Like even, even before I had, like, I was surprised to read all that when I, whenever I first got into this book. When I went online, everyone's like, oh, Shalon chapters. I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah, they were my favorite the first time. And honestly, they're my favorite right now. I would say actually right now, I don't know which one I am enjoying more between Kaladin and Dalinar slash Adolin. Um, mm -hmm. The Dalinar yeah, stuff feels weird because like we know everything. And same with Kaladin and his flashback. Like, I don't know. It, it's tough. It's not that I'm not enjoying them. I'm not saying that, but it's just like. Who's giving me more foreshadowing is really what I'm after. And Shalon absolutely and is still stuff. like even a bigger mystery, right? So maybe that's why we were kind of like missing her at the moment. Yeah, it's 
on the reread, she's the most fulfilling and the most like interesting to dive into. Mm-hmm. Character wise, perhaps the the boys have a bit more to offer. But I feel like we're getting oh, I don't know, maybe maybe that's a bit of a wild statement. I don't know. I don't know if it is. I mean, Adolin for me is someone that I'm paying attention to a lot more on this reread as someone who liked Adolin a lot in the first book and a half and then kind of just fell to the wayside with him. And I didn't really I didn't care about his moments as much in Rhythm of War. So I'm trying to spend more time with him and and engage with that character just a little bit more so I can get something out of it. So we'll see. We'll see. We're still very early in the Dalinar. Um, we need to get by the strap. I mean, the strap goes all the way through, unfortunately. <laughs> like, the strap just sucks. The strap is, like, literally safe for the climax of the book. Oh, like, God. And the strap! It was I! <laughs> you know, like, after the glorious ending, we're still dealing with it. So dumb. Oh, oh, uh, strap, no, it's, not that, mate. it's not that bad. I can't it's wait till it's over. I just don't want to read it again, that's all. But no. <laughs> I love everything else around it, so it's, oh, yeah. it's it's a good time, man. It was a good batch of chapters. And uh hey, man, longest episode, episodes. I think. I think it was mostly of me talking about counting cards and blackjack. And <laughs> you had some good analogies this week, dude. You were getting philosophical. We'll, ha- we'll have to listen back and see if they're actually good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, ru- the Russian literature portions. The staff hey. infections hit my brain. <laughs> dude, it's all that adaptation talk, man. That's right. We'll be there. Whenever it happens, we'll be there somehow. That's right. I know it. I know it. Even as our Kremlin, I'm still holding on to our Kremlin cameo. I hope so, man. I really do. But yeah, guys, as always, thank you for accompanying us on this episode of Lost in Rosha. Remember, the most important chapter a man can read is the next one. We'll see you next week to dive into chapters 23 and 24. If you enjoyed this episode of the podcast, be sure to leave us a review on whichever platform you listen on. If you have any feedback, questions, or theories, span read us at lostinroshar at gmail.com. We'll see you next time on Lost in Roshar, and remember to keep those safe hands covered. <laughs>